world for climate change. Retreating sea ice and glaciers and thawing permafrost are not partisan issues. They are social, environmental, and economic ones. As Chris, the 17-year-old hunter from Gamble, explained, climate change is creating a new challenge for his people. Storms are more frequent and more intense. The ice is more fragile and takes longer to arrive each year. Hunters must now travel more than 100 miles to find the whales and walrus they used to harvest just offshore. The impacts of climate change are evident throughout Alaska, and they must be addressed in the context of a healthy resource extraction economy. Last fall, I established the Alaska Climate Change Strategy and appointed 20 outstanding Alaskans to the leadership team. The team is charged with advising my administration on critical and timely action to address climate change challenges that will safeguard Alaskans now and for future generations. A healthy future means a healthy Alaska. Nearly 40,000 additional Alaskans are now receiving health care since I accepted Medicaid expansion. <laughs> Many lives have been saved or drastically improved. And Medicaid expansion has brought over 500 million additional federal dollars and hundreds of jobs into our economy during a time of recession all at minimal cost to the state. However, health care continues to be one of our largest expenditures each year. We have been working internally with other states as well as with the federal government to explore options to reduce overall health care for all Alaskans. We've been successful in reducing health care insurance premiums in Alaska by 26 percent this year. Establish a insurance program that is now being modeled around the country. We are also anticipating that after years <clears throat> of unified efforts by many Alaskans, the life-saving Eisenbeck Road will finally be built. <laughs> Despite many obstacles, Alaskans persevered in their fight for access across federal land to safely secure emergency medical treatment for the residents of King Cove. When we pull together for a common goal, Alaskans are mighty and victories are won. <laughs> Even with all the good news, there's still one thing standing in the way of truly controlling our destiny, and that's our, in our inability to get our own fiscal house in order. Credit rating <clears throat> agencies, investors, employers, and the real estate market are all waiting for the long-term sustainable fiscal solution. Without one, Alaska's economy will remain in jeopardy. We celebrate that oil throughput and price, oil prices are up. But even with these positive developments, the fact remains that the pipeline currently is three-quarters empty. Oil revenues, which once funded up to 90 percent of our state budget, now fund approximately 30 percent. Controlling our destiny requires accepting that our financial assets, such as the permanent fund, generates most of our current revenue. When combined with broad-based direct participation by individuals, Alaskans can take charge of our fiscal future. <laughs> Unfortunately, in recent years, Alaska has fallen behind the rest of the country and the consequences are significant. We are the only state that does not have a financial connection between its economy and the government services provided. The only state funding a huge deficit from savings. And the only state that does not have either a statewide income tax or sales tax or both. On the other hand, we are also the only state that pays its residents a dividend and that we will continue to do. We have the resources, we have the wealth. I ask each of you, do we together have the courage 
to seize Alaska's destiny and pay a modest temporary tax, accept a $1,200 and growing dividend, and use the permanent fund earnings in a manner that's fair to future generations. Over the past three years, the failure to adopt a sustainable fiscal plan has caused the state to drain $14 billion in one-time savings. Let's put $14 billion in perspective. Last year, our municipalities identified their top three wish lists, infrastructure projects. For a combined total of $2.5 billion, three major infrastructure projects could have been built in many communities throughout Alaska. Think of the jobs the economic boom, the needed improvements across the state that could have been secured for $2.5 billion. Instead, we have spent $14 billion in savings, really with little to show for it. And now, we've run out of savings to cover the deficit. Let me be clear. The longer we hold on to partisanship, the longer we hold on to the deficit. When I ran for governor in 2014, the state had a $1.6 billion deficit that was not being addressed. That deficit quickly escalated to $3.7 billion in 2015. Community and business leaders across Alaska recognized that no solution to our budget deficit was possible without a plan for using the earnings from our permanent fund. When no component of the sustainable fiscal plan passed in 2016, including the Permanent Fund Protection Act, I made the extremely difficult decision to reduce the dividend appropriation in order to save the dividend program itself. This past session, the House did pass a complete fiscal plan. Thank you. And the Senate and House both passed legislation that reduced the PFD to a sustainable level. Nobody in this building wanted to reduce the permanent fund dividend. I know how hard that decision was. I also know that the worst decision we can make at this time is no decision. Our fiscal problems will not be resolved through inaction. I also thank both bodies for bringing the Small Explorer Oil Tax Credit Program to an end. It was a necessary step in getting our fiscal house in order. Now that the program has terminated, I have introduced legislation to pay the credits owed to these small companies at a discounted amount that result in no additional cost to the state. It is time to put Alaskans back to work. And that's why I introduced the Alaska Economic Recovery Act. It does not take a team of economists to tell us what we already know. The economy is in recession. And Alaska has the highest unemployment in the nation. At the same time, lean capital budgets over the last few years have meant our schools, roads, and infrastructure are way overdue for maintenance. These projects were important, and they benefit Alaskans across 60 communities, from our youth to our seniors. For example, school roofs in Cantwell and Nome need replacement. Three schools in the Matsu Borough need water system replacement. Our Anchorage and Ketchikan Pioneer homes need important upgrades. And we know that the Port of Anchorage is in dire need of repairs and upgrades. This bill includes partial funding of phase one of that work in conjunction with funding from the municipality of Anchorage. Passage of the Economic Recovery Act will reduce our huge growing contingent liability of deferred maintenance throughout the state provide a needed shot in the arm to the economy and create jobs. Move us towards a balanced overall solution. I have often said that one of the best cures for many of Alaska's social ills is a job. The Alaska Economic Recovery Act is an opportunity in the near term to put Alaskans to work in the very communities where they live. Now you might be wondering how I can be so upbeat about the state of the state in the light of the challenging fiscal circumstances in which we find ourselves. No question, our prosperity hinges on solving that problem. But I have faith in Alaskans. We are hardworking and practical, and we will step up when needed.
Let me explain <clears throat> what I mean. As I have mentioned before, I was born in Fairbanks and spent my earliest years in, there and in Delta Junction. Following our move to Delta, my dad had to be hospitalized in Fairbanks for months after a serious forklift accident. This left my mom alone to care for four small children in our rustic home with no running water or electricity and only a fireplace for heat. My oldest sibling, Bob, 10 years old at the time, vividly recalls the hours before and after school helping our mom gather and chop wood to keep the fire going during the waking hours. The nights were long and bitterly cold. Uh, we had one hot water bottle that my mom would rotate each night at bedtime to her four children. There was no income during this time. A collection jar was set up at Art Knopfke's grocery store for our family. A Delta resident, Hank Brewis, and his wife, Alice, learned of our dire situation. Hank came to our home and saw that we were barely making it. Hank said, come on, you're all moving in with us. The Bruises already had four children of their own, and yet they took us in until Dad was back on his feet again. Our families became lifelong friends. Even after my dad was better, work was scarce, we had to scrape together a living. One endeavor involved selling ads and publishing the Walkers Weekly, a local newspaper my brother Bob and I would deliver throughout Delta on our bikes. Additionally, for several years, we advertised in the Reader's Digest and the Red Book magazine. For one dollar, we would write letters from Santa that my dad would drive 90 miles to North Pole to mail. I remember feeling like it was a pretty big part of Santa's operation at that time. <laughs> so standing before you tonight as your governor, I can say that I know what it's like to have plenty. And I have known what it's like to have practically nothing. And leading the state at this critical time, I often reflect upon my family's history that defines me. My family had to face its challenges with courage and determination. We would assess our option to come up with a plan. We would all do more than our fair share. We would conserve our resources, be creative, and pull together for the good of the family. It is the capacity and empathy and generosity like that of the Brewis family and the experience of my own family's perseverance and adaptability that form my opinion of what it means to be an Alaskan. And knowing that there are over 730,000 of us out there, I can't help but be optimistic that we can tackle any challenge that comes our way. Beyond these security and economic issues, what I've heard most people long for is a renewed sense of public trust and a respectful public discourse from our leaders. Frustration over divisive partisanship is evident, and Alaskans have had enough. Some folks find it politically useful to talk as if we could solve all of our fiscal challenges by cutting state jobs. They suggest that we can balance the budget solely on the backs of the men and women who serve our state. They want to identify where the cut should come from, but they resort to cheap caricatures of state workers as nothing more than bureaucrats and paper pushers, clocking in at 8 o'clock, clocking out at 4.30 without adding any real value. The cuts only plan is no plan at all. If that wasn't clear before the public crisis, safety crisis, that makes it obvious.